Okay, great. So welcome everybody um, to the uh, latest installment of the Ethereum uh, HK meetup. Uh, my name is Jahan Chu and I'm the managing partner and co-founder uh, of Kinetic, which is a Hong Kong blockchain investment firm. Uh, we do high frequency trading and uh, investments. Um, and uh, one of, we are one of the earliest kind of funds in Asia. Uh, and I founded the Ethereum meetup back in early 2014. So we're really excited today uh, to be joined by Mike Garland from Alchemy. Uh, Alchemy is an incredible company based in San Francisco. Uh, which is really one of the cornerstones of the Ethereum ecosystem in terms of node provision and infrastructure, but I'll let Mike tell you uh, a bit more about that. Um, just a disclosure, just as I did in the, uh, in the meetup description, uh, Kinetic is a, an investor in Alchemy, uh, along with uh, Reed Hoffman and Jerry Yang and many, many other cool people. So we're excited to be that. Um, and uh, so obviously I'm completely biased. So, uh, but the point of today really is to just talk about uh, ETH 2.0. Um, I think we've been hearing a lot more about E2.0 as uh, phase zero starts to uh, get a lot more kind of press about um, starting soon, we hope. Uh, maybe after a few false starts, but uh, start eventually it will. Uh, and we're really going to start seeing staking happening. Um, you know, I think there's a, a minimum threshold, which I'm sure Mike will tell us about. Um, but one of the things that's been interesting is how much kind of noise and reverse inquiry I've been getting about uh, from larger kind of like crypto institutions wanting to know more and wanting to get more involved uh, in Ethereum 2.0. Uh, and that's a really great signal because it shows that, you know, even if there are, you know, other major products that are launching these days, like, you know, Celo and obviously Polkadot, um, there, it's undeniable that Ethereum uh, is the largest ecosystem, it's the largest developer base, it's the largest kind of application base, um, and that uh, this really marks a major kind of turning point uh, for Ethereum, uh, which will kind of set in motion really what we hope will be the baseline for a lot of technology going forward. So ETH 2.0, I think we all really need to know a little bit more about it. And I think from the financial side of things, understanding what the kind of incentives and mechanism for staking is, uh, is really going to be uh, kind of quite critical. So that's why I brought Mike in. Um, and with that, I'm going to mute, I guess everybody's already muted. Uh, thanks for that. And um, I'll turn it over to Mike Garland from Alchemy. Take it away, Mike. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jahan. Um, yeah, let me just share my screen here. First of all, thank you uh, very much for having me. Really excited to, uh, to talk with you all and, and be a part of this, uh, this instance of your meetup. Um, really cool to get exposure to some other, uh, some other pockets of the blockchain ecosystem. It's really glad to be here. Um, Great. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see my, uh, my screen? Excellent. Um, perfect. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit before I happen, um, like John mentioned, my name is Mike Arland. Um, I lead a bunch of the product work at Alchemy, um, including the, the kind of efforts into ETH2. Um, my background is is coming from the engineering side. Um, so any of you that, that have kind of deeper technical questions, feel free to, to ask as we go along or, or there's going to be some time for questions at the end. Um, for, for the bulk of the presentation, um, decided to keep it kind of uh, high level, zooming a little bit in um, as we go, just to give kind of top level context on ETH2, what staking will look like there, um, and then some of the infrastructure side, which is where we have kind of the deepest expertise. Um, and so uh, figured I'd start by, I know a lot of you probably aren't familiar with Alchemy and what we do. Um, that kind of colors the, the angle on which we'll be, uh, we'll be taking on ETH2 today. So I wanted to give you guys a little background to, to see where we're coming from. Um, jump into just super quick blitz, uh, blitz take on ETH2 as a whole, um, and then zooming in on uh, kind of stake, uh, staking within the whole ETH2 ecosystem. Um, and then just a, a quick thought on what's next, um, and then uh, plenty of time for, for questions and answers. Um, perfect. So Alchemy. Um, basically, Alchemy is a uh, blockchain infrastructure and developer tool platform um, with a focus on the Ethereum ecosystem in particular. Um, we've been around for uh, almost three years in the blockchain space now, um, working uh, as, in, as a developer platform for, for nearly two. Um, 
And uh, lucky enough to have uh, an awesome roster of investors to support us if we do that, including uh, Kinetic and, and Jahan, and as you mentioned, some, some uh, kind of awesome folks like Reed Hoffman, uh, Jay-Z, Peter Thiel, um, supporting us along the way. Um, and really, we're, we're a product-driven organization. Uh, we're almost entirely uh, engineers. Uh, our product is, is very much meant to speak for itself. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, have expertise building uh, infrastructure and, and developer tools at, at some of the, the kind of most prominent companies here in the Bay Area and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and as far as what we've done uh, in the Ethereum world, um, our infrastructure platform uh, reaches something like 4 million users per week across 197 countries. I think that's my personal favorite stat just because uh, it also signals that Ethereum is alive and well and, and extremely healthy. Um, especially the 197 countries part, the, the global reach of, of this ecosystem is, is really tremendous. Um, we also work with 70% with of the, the top Ethereum applications by users, by volume, um, by most of the relevant metrics. Um, our focus has really been building this kind of like production scale infrastructure um, and developer tools to support those teams that have reach, have really significant demand, um, and uh, have had, had a pretty uh, wide adoption out there as well. Um, and as a consequence of that, we power something like uh, tens of billions of dollars, uh, I think close to 30 or $40 billion per year in, in yearly volume. Um, and to, to zoom in on kind of one uh, particular uh, and, and hot area of the ecosystem, uh, support something like one, one uh, billion dollars in total staked DeFi assets, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so as far as the teams we, we power, um, you know, a, a bunch of recognizable logos, uh, Augur, CryptoKitties, uh, Maker, ZeroX, a bunch of folks that you're familiar with, um, but really uh, across the board, pretty much the, the largest companies in, in every category uh, across the blockchain ecosystem. Um, I won't dig in too much here, but um, this is kind of the bread and butter of, of what we built. So there are really two components to Alchemy. There's uh, developer tools, dashboards, like all these visual um, uh, applications and, and tools for uh, blockchain developers to be successful. Um, but what I wanted to highlight here, since we're talking about staking, which is, is primarily um, uh, a, a lot of the value you get is from the quality of the infrastructure. Um, really, that's, that's the bread and butter of what we do is uh, build better infrastructure. Um, our initial platform with a focus on uh, blockchain developers and their needs um, but as, as uh, staking and ETH2 come out, um, focusing again on, on a, a kind of a new audience there. Um, in the, uh, the Ethereum world, the, the, the kind of main thing that we've done is, you know, the, the node hosting service on the left, uh, this is kind of the infrastructure that most companies will build out in-house themselves. It's also what kind of most APIs that um, support Ethereum today um, use as far as infrastructure. Um, I'll, I'll avoid, uh, you know, uh, going down, down any uh, holes too deep here. Would, would be super happy to talk about it in the questions if anybody's interested. But um, what we've designed is the system on the right, which has been meant to solve a, a number of really significant issues um, specific to blockchain, specific to Ethereum um, with this kind of infrastructure setup, which is, is, is kind of a tried and true way of scaling from the Web2 world. Um, what we've really built is, is this infrastructure platform designed ground up for Web3, for Ethereum. Um, and it's, you know, demonstrably more reliable performance, uh, consistent in terms of data, a bunch of really nice properties that, that come out of that when you design with Web3 in mind. Um, and then on top of that, like I mentioned, uh, the goal is to uh, solve the infrastructure problem and then deliver a ton of value for the people we work with um, in terms of uh, tools on top of that. Um, and so already, you know, in the, in the two, two years we've been working in the Ethereum ecosystem have built out. Uh, tons of developer tools and, and dashboards that are, are super helpful for people who are, are building in that space. Um, perfect. So without further ado, uh, ETH2, uh, the, the meat of the matter for today. Um, and so uh, just to start with a little bit of a very, very brief introduction to ETH2, uh, assuming that people have, have relatively little knowledge uh, to begin with before we zoom in on staking. Um, so first of all, uh, E2 means different things depend on when in time you are talking about. Uh, as most of you are aware, I'm sure there's a phased rollout, uh, as Jahan mentioned, uh, phase zero optimistically is, is coming in July, likely uh, perhaps a, a bit later than that. Um, but just, just to know kind of what we're talking about and when, um, so phase zero is, is basically what's called the beacon chain, uh, pretty much only proof of stake functionality for the sake of proof of stake. Um, no state, no smart contracts, no accounts, these kinds of things. Um, so pretty bare bones functionality just to get those, those mechanisms kind of ironed out and complete. 
Um, phase one adds what's called charting, um, which we'll go into a, in a little bit more detail in a second, which is kind of the main scalability mechanism of, of ETH 2.0. Um, slotted for some time in, in 2021. Um, and phase two uh, is, is kind of accounts and contracts, uh, the, the kind of full functionality for uh, Ethereum, the, the way that applications deal with it, um, the way kind of most people building in, in the traditional sense uh, think when they think of Ethereum and, and eventually Ethereum 2.0. Um, so for the more, majority of this conversation, I'll be talking um, in kind of broad strokes about Ethereum 2.0 um, without zooming in on a, a specific phase. Most of the staking functionality is going to be there with, with phase zero and, and kind of the, the various sub phases of phase zero. So um, you can assume that, that what we'll be talking about is going to be relevant uh, in 2020, certainly. Um, but uh, it, you know, it also applies to phase one and phase two as those uh, extra layers of functionality are rolled out. Perfect. Um, so why do we care about ETH2 in the first place? Uh, the main things, uh, which are our core, whether you're a, a staker, a miner, validator, um, kind of any uh, stakeholder, scalability is huge. Um, basically the ability to send more transactions, more data across the network without having to pay tons of gas fees or wait a super long time, uh, as is the case with Ethereum 1.0 right now. Um, accessibility, um, basically making sure that uh, the, the features of, of the blockchain uh, in all their entirety, entirety are accessible to everybody who wants to partake in them. So not just mining clusters, these, these uh, large folks with um, you know, huge data farms and ASICs participating in, in proof of work mining today. Um, and then one of the consequences of that is, is greater security. So uh, you know, the, the principle behind security of, of these networks uh, kind of uh, is correlated or, or causal super strongly with uh, how decentralized they're able to be. Um, and proof of stake in Ethereum 2.0 in general are, are meant to kind of increase the, uh, the factor of decentralization, if you will, um, which has a, a direct impact on security. Um, so to zoom in on, on the first one, I'll be brief here since it's, it's not super relevant to, to staking. A, a couple of, of uh, consequences of this later on, which I'll touch on. But um, so sharding uh, is, is the main mechanism by which uh, ETH 2.0 will, will achieve scalability. To give you a sense, ETH 1.0 allows for something like 14 transactions per second. Um, the real, real main consequence of this is it makes it very, very hard for builders to build the kind of applications they want um, without kind of unnecessary roadblocks in the place. So, you know, this is where we're spending a lot of our, the time in our trenches, in the trenches right now with our current customers. Um, you know, anybody who's building is, is struggling uh, up against the fact that gas is very expensive, mining times are, are kind of longer than expected. Um, it, it really makes the developer experience and the user experience uh, much more difficult to deal with uh, for anyone who's building in this ecosystem. Um, and so it's, I, can, I can attest, you know, uh, working with these teams day in and day out, it's not just a theoretical thing where we want to push this cap. Uh, it, it really is important, I think, for the long-term health of, of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, so with E2.0, it scales directly with the number of shards, um, also the number of transactions in every block. Um, the proposals around both of those, something like 64 shards and, and pushing block sizes to be a, lot, a little bit larger, um, optimistically put us in the realm of uh, 7,500 transactions per second. So uh, kind of much larger scale there, there which is, uh, is, is great to see. Obviously, uh, this stuff is still being worked on, so we'll see how it nets out when it actually hits uh, phase zero and, and some sort of main net. But, um, the metrics are there at least to make this extremely exciting. Um, and a common point of reference in, in the blockchain world um, to kind of uh, you know, point to what a healthy number of transactions per second is, something like Visa, um, uh, you know, global payments company, uh, does something like 1,700 transactions per second. Um, so ETH 1.0, very clearly uh, below the standard there, uh, couldn't support like a full uh, global payments rails like Visa as it stands today. Um, but when we start to talk, talk about the sharding mechanisms of ETH 2.0, it actually it starts to become very realistic, which is a, a pretty amazing switch. Um, so that's kind of the, the full vision. Uh, one one uh, very important note, uh, when it comes to sharding and scale scalability, um, ETH 2.0 phase zero will actually have zero transactions per second. Um, so very explicitly, they are not uh, launching phase zero with accounts, transfers, transactions. Um, it's kind of a way of focusing on the proof of stake mechanisms of the chain uh, to begin with, so they can iron all that out, have all of the, uh, the stakers onboarded, get the ecosystem healthy, um, and, and go from there. 
Um, so all these promises for application developers, uh, you know, there, there can be some confusion when they see July, ETH2 is launching, all these promises around uh, scalability. Um, those things are still coming, they're just uh, a little bit farther out. So the initial beacon chain, really for staking only, uh, no transfers, no accounts, uh, no smart contracts, all of the things we kind of uh, know and love about Ethereum. Um, and then it's, uh, like I mentioned, coming with those later phases uh, in 2021, 2022, a little bit further down the road. Um, so when it comes to accessibility and security, um, that's really where staking comes in. Uh, it's a pretty monumental change from proof of work with Ethereum 1.0 to uh, proof of stake in Ethereum 2.0. Um, and there are some very good reasons for, for going through that effort and kind of the, the massive and amazing um, kind of research work that the, uh, the Ethereum Foundation and, and others have done to, to actually make this switch. Um, and there's, there's good reason for it. So uh, staking on ETH2 is a massive thing. Uh, it it's, uh, has tons of advantages and it's, it's also a really significant problem to those who have large stakes in the Ethereum ecosystem. For many, it's, it's actually a 100 million or, or, or more dollar problem to get right um, and really understand. So um, this is where I want to spend the bulk of the presentation today is, is basically just diving in on the staking aspect of ETH2.0, kind of what we know about it today, um, how it's trending, and then kind of what the consequences are going forward. Um, so uh, really briefly, proof of work to proof of stake, what do these things mean in the first place uh, and, and what are the consequences there? So proof of work, of course, is you have miners competing to solve these, uh, these effectively math problems uh, to be kind of minted, the, the one who uh, gets to say which block uh, becomes the newest on the chain. Um, you know, computing power is the resource you're contributing to the network very explicitly. Um, to, to kind of earn the right to mint those blocks. Proof of stake, the, the angle is a little bit different. Uh, your, your kind of value provided to the network is, uh, is capital in, in the form of staked ETH. Um, and the reasons this is, is are, are really important, one totally external to the network um, is that proof of stake is significantly more energy efficient. Um, so uh, proof of work uh, at this point uh, with kind of the, the lack of efficiency uh, given the, the really, really high degree of competition is actually less energy efficient than mining for gold, which is, is pretty staggering. Uh, and by a wide margin, it's almost, almost three times less efficient uh, per dollar of value mined on the Bitcoin network uh, than it is to, to mine physical gold, um, which I, I, I found super surprising when I, I first learned that. Um, so there, there is this really significant kind of uh, physical world consequence to um, the actual uh, consensus algorithm that these, these networks are using. And proof of stake has really dramatic uh, effects in, in the, the realm of being just more environmentally friendly, more energy uh, efficient. Um, and uh, there, there are actually some practical things that, that flow from that as well. Um, like it, it's, it's kind of more accessible, uh, easier to run boxes that are capable of participating in the proof of stake uh, component. Um, which has this nice effect of not only making it mo more accessible, but making it more decentralized. So because I don't have to have these specialized circuit boards that are super, super tailored and efficient for mining Ethereum in particular, um, I no longer need to be specifically a company that's uh, built around mining for Ethereum. I can be somebody who happens to have 32 ETH um, and wants to use that ETH to help secure the network and also uh, receive staking rewards. Um, so no specialized hardware. Um, the goal here is increased security, uh, increased number of participants. Um, and that means things like 51% attacks uh, become harder, less likely, um, kind of more diversity within the ecosystem of, of miners, quote unquote, uh, means that the whole ecosystem benefits in terms of uh, the security constraints that it, it can guarantee. Um, Perfect. So when it comes to staking, uh, a lot of the, the concepts will be familiar if you're familiar with staking from, from other avenues. Um, some will be new. Um, so just a level set on kind of what staking means and a little bit of vocabulary here. Um, so when it comes to staking, the, the main actor, uh, the, the kind of main uh, star of the show that we'll be talking about are, are validators. Um, so these are kind of a, the minor equivalents uh, from, from the proof of work world. Um, but what validators do is they basically um, stake some amount of asset um, as, a, as kind of their uh, leverage, as, as their sign that they're, they're committed to the ecosystem. And what that buys them is the ability to vote on the next block. So uh, in ETH2 and in others, other places, this is called the testing. Um, it's basically uh, the ability for a validator to look at a new block and say either, yes, this looks good to me, um, nobody's cheating here, uh, the data is correct, or no, this is uh, incorrect, and I think we should uh, flag that, that somebody is doing something malicious here. 
Um, the other thing that the uh, validators can do is uh, they can actually be the ones to propose new blocks, so not just vote, but actually be um, kind of active in, in uh, saying what should belong as the, the next state of the chain. Um, and the, the reason everybody is doing this, the, the kind of incentive to do so is that there are very real rewards to participating uh, in the network in this way. So uh, in the proof of work world, you're uh, rewarded for solving the math problem, uh, for becoming the person who, who mines the block. In the same way, if you're a validator on a proof of stake system, um, you should be incentivized, you should be rewarded for uh, putting your capital at risk. Um, and that comes in the, the form of staking rewards. Um, so uh, for ETH, at least to start with, it looks like that'll be something like uh, 10 to 11% rewards per year. Um, so depending on how much you're, ETH you're uh, staking, uh, really, really significant uh, outcomes there for stakers as, as possibilities, which is a lot of reason why people care about this in the first place. Um, the converse to that is uh, there is a risk to staking. Um, it's not just all upside. Um, you can be slashed or you can receive penalties. Um, so these are the two kinds of ways in, in ETH2 that you can kind of see downside risk. Um, slashing is basically if you attempt to cheat or you make a mistake that looks like cheating to that work, um, there can be really significant penalties to that. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but it depends on things like how you cheated, how many people cheated over a particular uh, amount of time. Um, but basically, this is a, a huge no-no on any proof of stake network. Um, it, the, the kind of whole mechanism of, of proof of stake depends a little bit on, on this slashing mechanism and making sure that there are, are real consequences, real financial incentives for people um, to act uh, kind of non-maliciously. Um, one, one example of that is basically saying uh, at the same block number, two different blocks of information uh, that would be considered uh, valid blocks. If, if you as a single validator um, kind of attest to two different blocks at the same height, that's, uh, that's one of these examples of, of kind of attempting to cheat. Um, the other penalty is, is a little bit simpler to understand. It's just uh, a penalty for downtime or, or unresponsiveness as a node. So if you're getting rewarded for uh, doing this att attestation, um, if you don't do the attestation, there's, there's a downside to that. Um, the nice part is, uh, you know, it, it also scales with the number of people who go down at the same time. But uh, in general, these penalties are, are relatively small compared to slashing and, and this kind of cheating mechanism. Um, Perfect. So uh, one of the interesting things about ETH2 is it has a very particular life cycle of, of validators. So wanted to quickly go through that just to give a little bit more sense of when we talk about a validator, what is it doing? And then eventually, you know, what impact does this have on uh, things like infrastructure, how we actually run these validators, how we as businesses need to think about, um, you know, supporting this part of, of our operations and ecosystem. Um, so really there are, are kind of uh, five separate phases. Uh, one of them has, has two different options depending on, on uh, whether you're a malicious actor or a benevolent actor. Um, so to become a validator, you always start with an initial deposit. Um, after that initial deposit, you go through kind of a, a pending period uh, before you become an active validator. Um, when you become an active validator, that's when you're, you're kind of attesting to blocks. Uh, you're actually actively participating in the network. Um, and then there are two ways to leave that state. So as long as you're an active uh, validator, you need to be attesting, proposing, doing all the, the things that healthy validators do. Um, if you decide that you've had enough, you want to take your rewards and walk away, um, you can kind of consciously exit your role as a validator. Um, or if you get caught cheating, uh, you can be forced out of your role as a validator through slashing, um, both of which kind of end the life cycle. Um, uh, one thing to note here is, um, most of the time when we're talking about validators, we'll be talking about the active state. These other, uh, other states tend to be transient. The, the validator, as we think about it, is the one that's uh, you know, voting on blocks, proposing blocks, actively participating in the network. Um, and so these things are kind of the mechanisms by which you become uh, one of those active, active validators or, uh, or, or leave your role uh, as such. Um, so uh, this, this is particularly relevant for anybody interested in staking. Um, how do I actually become a validator on ETH2? How do I, how do I get into staking in the first place? Um, kind of a little unintuitive, depending on how much you've, you've delved into this. Um, so actually to become a staker on ETH2.0, you need to make an initial deposit on the ETH1.0 network. Um, so there will be a kind of special contract that you can deposit ETH2, lock it up, and basically signal your intent to become a validator on ETH2. Um, right now with test networks, uh, this, this happens on the Gorley network, uh, kind of one of the, the test networks for ETH 1.0, um, which uh, lets you become a validator on the test network for ETH 2.0, but eventually this will all be uh, kind of main netified. 
Um, and you can make this deposit through a mainnet contract and, and become kind of a, a real world uh, ETH2 validator. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, this is really, really sensitive to reorgs. So for those of you familiar with the, the concept of reorgs, basically uh, different lengths of chain uh, causing uh, blocks to be swapped out even after they've appeared at the, the tip of a chain to a, a particular user. Um, this is a, a really big deal uh, in this case because I can stake 32 ETH and if that block gets reorganized, um, maybe the ETH2 chain thinks that I'm a, uh, an active validator who's, who's, been, uh, who, who's properly locked up their ETH, um, but because of a reorg, I've actually gotten that ETH back and haven't spent anything. Um, and it's important that I have that, that kind of real financial stake in what's going on. Um, and so ETH2 is actually really conservative about uh, reorgs. Like most applications we work with actually on the Ethereum side will uh, look at maybe four to six block confirmations before they consider something confirmed, um, which is roughly a minute to a minute and a half in, in real world time. Uh, because this is so important to all these mechanisms, me mechanisms going correctly, um, E2 is actually looking at something like 1,024 blocks um, plus some, some epics in, uh, in uh, the 2.0 chain. And the, the total time there uh, nets out to about seven and a half hours. Um, just because they really want to be sure that if you say your ETH is there and it's, it's part of a transaction, there's no chance that it'll ever be reorged. Uh, no realistic chance, at least. Um, so after the initial deposit phase, uh, you basically enter this, this pending state phase. Um, so this is when uh, your deposit is recognized and you can become uh, an actual validator on the, the ETH2 network. This is where the, the fun actually starts to begin. Hey, can you guys hear me? I think my, uh, my Bluetooth headphones went rogue and, and connected. Um, perfect. Uh, so in the pending state, uh, really what they're looking at is to make sure that your stake is large enough to be considered uh, a real validator here. So uh, in the ETH 2.0 world, you need to have at least 32 ETH staked uh, to become an active validator to, to kind of gain the right to attest to new blocks and propose new blocks. Um, and so during this pending phase, uh, the chain is looking at, you know, is that sum there? can we consider them a, an active validator? And then if they uh, are, we can kind of elevate them to this level of, of active. Um, something that's, that's pretty interesting here that, that teams should prepare for and, and kind of plan up front for is that um, there's actually a queue to join as a, a validator. So it's, it's actually not enough for me to just stake 32 ETH and start validating. Um, the goal is that uh, ETH 2.0 really wants there to be a, a relatively stable validator set. Um, so when it comes to onboarding or offboarding, actually, there's, there's actually kind of a waiting list mechanism. Um, if the waiting list is, is totally empty, if I'm the only buddy on there hoping to become a validator, um, that process takes about 25 minutes. Um, but uh, the expectation is that, uh, especially with the launch and, and these things uh, being relatively new, uh, there's going to be quite a bit of demand to join on as, as a validator. Um, and the waiting time for this could be days or as much as weeks if, if things are extremely busy. Um, Can I ask so, a quick question, Mike? Yeah, please. So how many, like, is there any estimate as to like uh, in the initial queue or the initial kind of set, how many validators uh, will be accepted? That's a, that's a very good question. I don't know off the top of my head uh, how many validators will, will be accepted. I, I you know, I, I would guess on the order of, of hundreds initially. Um, with, uh, with, with quite a bit of room to grow there. So one of the mechanisms we'll go to uh, in a bit is that uh, there's, there's kind of financial incentive to have exactly 32 ETH as your staked amount, not just a minimum of 32 ETH. Um, and so, you know, large organizations that hold much more ETH than that are gonna need to run many validators themselves. And so the eventual number on, on, on uh, ETH 2.0, you know, ideally is as many as possible. Like there, there are more security benefits to having more validators and so, uh, the people building this are, are incentivized to, uh, you know, make it as easy as possible for as many validators as possible to come on. Uh, as far as kind of this initial rollout phase, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm actually curious to know the answer to that myself. And I'll, I'll poke some of the folks who are working on uh, this test, test networks right now. I think there's going to be some, uh, some balance between that uh, kind of eventual goal of as many validators as possible and the, the kind of realistic near-term goal of just stability. Um, so yeah, not, not sure if there's a, an exact number that they're shooting for or, or even a cap on it to begin with, but. Uh, is, isn't, isn't there a minimum threshold to get uh, kind of the like phase zero going as well? Like a minimum number? I thought it was like 
the equivalent of, uh, I, I calculated it in dollars, I thought it was like $127 million of ETH needs to be kind of like uh, locked in before it starts. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so uh, yeah, it, realistically, like, uh, so, so that's the threshold for the actual staking mechanisms to start, like the proposals and attestations. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so in terms of like the, the further uh, functionality of, of ETH 2.0 starting, it, that's more bounded by kind of like the rollout of further phases. But, but yeah, actually, I don't know what the specific number is in terms of Ether dollars for, uh, for that starting. But yeah, you can imagine it, it's not going to make sense to have uh, a very small number of nodes validating at the beginning. Um, and so having kind of that critical mass uh, initially to get going is, is obviously going to be important for, for the network to succeed. I think it was like around half a million ETH. Half a million ETH. 500,000 plus, something like that. Makes sense. Um, awesome. Um, cool. So um, in terms of the, the life cycle of validators continuing on there, um, so once you go from uh, pending, you have valid 32 ETH, uh, you're, uh, you're a good actor, you own to active modes. So like I mentioned before, this is where uh, validators really live. Uh, you can be here for kind of uh, any period of time as, as long as you're behaving well and attesting to blocks. Um, your, uh, your kind of responsibilities as a validator, you have to attest, otherwise there are penalties. So you have to, to vote on the, the active block. Um, this happens once every six minutes uh, as, as kind of a minimum for, for each validator. Um, you also have the ability to occasionally propose blocks, kind of uh, an, an optional piece of functionality for the validators. Uh, if, if you don't want to participate in proposal, no big deal. Uh, attestation is really that core necessary piece uh, to make sure you don't get penalized or slashed. Um, and then uh, the, the real thing here is you'll remain active uh, unless one of three things happens. So number one is if your funds drop below 16 ETH, uh, you'll be removed as a validator. In this initial phase, there's no, uh, no uh, way that that can happen other than basically penalties and slashing. Um, so as long as you're a, a good actor, you don't have to worry about this one. It's no big deal. Um, the second thing is I as a validator no longer want to keep up my responsibilities. I can ask to leave. Um, some, some kind of interesting consequences there that we'll get into in a second, but um, there's basically this voluntary exit. Um, and the third is you're caught cheating. So you're getting slashed. Uh, even if your balance is above 16, if you commit uh, certain kinds of, of effectively fraud on, on ETH2, uh, the chain actually has the ability to just force you to, to exit um, for, your, for your bad behavior. Um, so hopefully uh, anybody who's running staking, uh, staking rigs out there and, and, and validators, uh, you'll only ever have to experience the, the initial deposit pending and active until you want to uh, basically take out your stake and, and do something else with it. Um, but there are these other mechanisms by which you can be uh, effectively forced out. Um, so first looking at the, the kind of healthy version of this, uh, the, the kind of willful exit. Um, so uh, really interesting thing here, kind of the, the reverse of the waiting period in the queue to enter. Um, there's actually a waiting period in the queue to exit as well. Um, I actually think this is one of the, the more important things to key on if you're considering staking, um, just because uh, the same kind of queue mechanisms apply where in the best case, it'll take 25 minutes to leave. Um, in the worst case, if a lot of people are trying to exit, um, it could take days or weeks. Um, and during those days or weeks, you need to keep attesting or you can still be slashed. So even if you've signaled your, your intent to leave, um, you're kind of still on the hook to perform the, the roles uh, of a validator while you're in that kind of transient, uh, transient state. Um, and so uh, it's not as easy as just saying, hey, I'm done validating, I'm gonna walk away with my money, um, which I think is, is counterintuitive to a lot of people, um, especially if, uh, if you're choosing to exit, uh, maybe because you need to shut down your infrastructure, make changes there, uh, it's really something you need to, to plan up front for. Um, and uh, let's see, so uh, basically the, the, the reason for that is, um, the network really doesn't want people to be able to uh, do something that is slashing worthy and try to exit before uh, there's a chance to catch them, uh, before there's, there's a chance to actually penalize them. So kind of like the hit and run uh, way of, of trying to cause damage to the network. Um, so the, uh, and, and also the, the same stability requirements uh, that, that come with entering the network in the first place. So don't want too much churn in, in the set of validators, uh, whether it's because of real world events or, or something else. Uh, so this whole queue mechanism is, is meant to keep that kind of as stable as possible. Um, so when it comes to slashing, 
uh, basically this is, uh, slashing is the version where you've kind of either intentionally or, or through some mistake in your infrastructure done something that looks like cheating to the network. Um, as far as what happens when you slash, you immediately get penalized one ETH. There's kind of a minimum penalty uh, if you do something that's slashing worthy, uh, where immediately that gets taken from uh, the amount that you have staked. Um, then the, the kind of more serious long-term consequences, you're forced to exit. Um, so you no longer could be an active validator. Um, you've been kind of labeled the cheater by the system and, and you're forced to no longer participate. Um, and you're marked basically as a, a special person in the queue uh, for exiting. Um, and the, the mark effectively means that you'll be assessed for further damages later, depending on what happens during that exit period. Um, All right, quick question there. So if you get slashed once, then you're forced to exit? Uh, yes. So, so really important distinction here is uh, slashing versus penalties. So if you get slashed, you're forced to exit. Slashed is double signing blocks, doing things that look like uh, explicitly malicious behavior to the, the ecosystem. Penalties are basically like, my infrastructure stopped running, I stopped responding, like things that are much more uh, kind of low stakes as, as far as the proof of stake uh, mechanism is concerned. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, Vitalik has gone on record saying, if you're up something like 60, 70% of the time, uh, you'll still be net profitable um, as, a, as a validator. So the small fines that you get will be outweighed by um, the profit that you're getting from, uh, from actually doing the validation. Um, it's really when you get into these like more significant double signing, uh, kind of like misrepresenting data and blocks, these sorts of things that are considered uh, kind of non-negotiables by, by uh, Casper and proof of, proof of stake that you uh, kind of immediately get booted from the network. Um, just more on the penalties side of things. So let's say your infrastructure do, does, does go down and you don't respond for X number of uh, kind of rounds. Um, do you continue getting penalized in, until you're drop until six, drop under 16 and then you're out? Or how does that work? Yeah, so, so in terms of those kind of like reliability penalties, there are two things that matter there. We actually have a, a graph so I can go into more detail on it. But um, so number one is the amount of time that you're, you're out for. So there's this concept of, of epics in, in, uh, uh, in ETH2, which is that kind of six minute window in which uh, a validator is expected to attest at least once. Um, so you're basically penalized per uh, epic that you miss. Um, but the penalties are actually steeper if there are uh, more people that miss the epics at, at any given time. So uh, if more people go offline at once, uh, there's kind of more significant penalties, which increase with the percentage of, of validators that go offline. Um, and the idea there is they, they really want to promote this, this kind of heterogeneous validator ecosystem um, just to make sure that the network is super strong. Um, and the idea is if 40% you know, of the validators in the ecosystem are going down at once, there's probably too much centralization there. Um, you know, maybe something that looks like a, a mining pool or, or these, these kind of large corporate miners in, in the proof of work world. Um, so there's, there's really those two variables there. One is, you know, how bad is my, uh, my downtime, uh, which, which scales with the number of, of epics that you missed. Um, and then how bad is the, the overall downtime for the ETH network, which, which increases the penalty if it's, if it's much worse. Um, I think this is honestly a little bit counterintuitive to people sometimes because, uh, I think the intuition is that if more people go down, I should be penalized less because it seems like it's less of my fault specifically. Um, but really the mechanism is, is meant to just make sure that the, the overall network is as diverse, heterogeneous and secure as possible. Um, so the economic incentives are, are trying to push people in directions that prevent that from happening in the first place. Um, Great. So uh, final part of the, the validator life cycle is, is kind of this exited state. Um, so this is when you kind of finally, uh, you know, hang up your jersey, you are done and, and retired as a, a validator. Um, you're no longer expected to attest, uh, which means, you know, any infrastructure you have, you can, you can shut down and, and not be worried about any penalties or slashing. Uh, the one caveat here is, so you have funds locked up to become a validator in the first place. Even when you're in the exited state, those funds uh, remain locked for uh, a full 24 hours if you're uh, kind of a good actor. Um, again, the idea here is just to prevent any kind of edge cases where somebody slashes and, and runs uh, immediately or, or commits, commits a slashable offense. Um, so uh, there is still the possibility that for a previous misbehavior, your funds could be slashed and removed during this point. Uh, but as long as you've, you've kind of behaved responsibility as a validator, it's just this one day waiting period for your, your funds to be collected. Um, if you were slashed, so if you were, if you were marked as, as one of these uh, kind of cheaters uh, when you entered the exit queue, 
Um, that waiting period is actually 36 days. Um, one of the big uh, reasons for that is uh, the network will be looking over the first half of that period, over the first 18 days, to see how many people got slashed. So as I just mentioned for kind of the penalty version, uh, that scales with the number of people who incurred the penalty, but so do does, so does the slashable offense, offenses. Um, so if, if, for instance, somebody tries a, a coordinated attack on the network where they try with many validators to uh, attest to um, some fraudulent block, um, there's a much more significant penalty um, for that kind of coordinated attack than there is if you're just a single validator who um, double signs or, or does one of these kind of uh, malicious, uh, malicious acts. Um, so as far as slashing and, and also the, the kind of uh, penalty mechanism, uh, this is a, a rough sense of, of how uh, the Ethereum Foundation and, and the, the folks building up the network think that these penalties will scale uh, with the number of validators who committed the same offense. Um, so uh, these numbers might look a little bit scary. So uh, basically as soon as a third of the validators uh, have committed a, a slashable offense in the, the same period as, as you, uh, you basically lose 100% of your ETH. So your entire staked uh, deposit um, is kind of forfeited to the network. Um, but, you know, in, in the wild, we'll be talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of validators. So um, the chances that uh, a third of those go down at once or a third of those um, kind of have the, the uh, same slashable offense as you is, is, is pretty unlikely. So um, the, the penalties, uh, so, and, and just to, to be clear, um, these penalties are for those slashable offenses in particular. Um, the, the actual ETH penalty for downtime offenses is a, a fraction of this. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned, if, if you're, uh, if you're down, uh, for, for some kind of reliability reason, uh, not kind of attesting to malicious data, uh, you can expect that the penalties won't be as, as steep as, as the penalties are for, for slashing as, as shown here. Uh, we had a couple of questions that I think are kind of like, uh, on this topic, uh, Tony was asking, uh, what happens to the slashed uh, ETH or penalized ETH? Um, interesting. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I know the way it works with other proof of stake networks, proof of stake networks is it's distributed amongst the uh, remaining healthy validators. Um, and so I would expect that that's how it works with ETH 2.0 as well. Um, that it's basically additional financial incentive uh, for the folks that are uh, behaving correctly on the system. Uh, but to be honest, I, I haven't actually looked into to that portion of it with, uh, you know, when there's a significant amount of ETH uh, slashed or, or slashed at all, how it gets distributed or, or who it goes to. But um, yeah, I would, I would guess that it goes to uh, kind of evenly distributed to the healthy participants in the network. Cool. And then there was another question for, from, from Christopher. Um, if you have more than 32 ETH on a, on a validator, can you go, can you get slashed more than 32? Yeah, so you, you can get slashed more than 32. The, the penalties and slashing all work as a percentage of the ETH that you have staked. Um, so we'll also get into this in a second, but uh, there is effectively no reason as a validator on ETH 2.0 to stake anything more than 32 ETH. Um, so there's no additional reward for staking more than 32 ETH and there are more significant downsides. Um, so you know the, the main mechanism there is you basically wanna run uh, as many validators as you can to support the, the total volume of, of ETH that you have. Um, because there is this uh, kind of unfortunate equation when it comes to expected value where the more you stake, uh, the more you, you're risking in, in terms of slashing, but uh, there's effectively zero upside um, in, in terms of the actual staking rewards that you're, you're making. Um, as, as with basically all of the kind of economics of ETH 2.0, um, the goal there is basically to uh, incentivize people to, to run more validators. Um, there's, there's kind of this top level notion that the more validators the ecosystem has, the more fault tolerant it is, the more tolerant to security um, vulnerabilities it is, all these things that are kind of nice properties and, and really desired amongst blockchain uh, ecosystems and networks. Um, and so uh, they, they've really kind of backed up uh, that thought with the economics here. Um, so that uh, to become a validator, you need to stake at least 32 ETH. Um, but to be a, an efficient validator who's, who's really paying attention to their bottom line, you want to stake exactly 32 ETH. Cool. Just want to do a time check. Um, so I think we've got maybe another like 10, 15, 10 minutes or so, a little bit more than 10 minutes to, to get through the presentation. Uh, but we want to leave enough time for people to ask questions. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we should be right on time there. Um, cool. So I figured for the, the last 10 minutes or so here, we can just dive into a little bit of 
the infrastructure uh, of, of staking and, and how that relates specifically to ETH2, because it's actually where some of the most interesting work is going to happen um, on ETH2 uh, in, in the coming months and coming years. Um, so let's say you want to become a validator, you understand that uh, full life cycle, um, you uh, hold at least 32 ETH and, and you want to kind of participate in the rewards that come along with being a validator on the network. Um, there are uh, three, in, in this case, in, in the most basic setup, two parts of the, the validator setup um, that are kind of critical to, to understand. Um, so number one is the actual validator. So this is the piece of software that takes in the blocks, votes on it, proposes the blocks. It has all the logic for um, doing the actual validate, validation, attestation, and proposal. Um, the other is a, a beacon node. So this is a node that has the full state of the chain. Um, think Ethereum full nodes, Ethereum archive nodes, these things that have, you know, all 7 million blocks, 9 million blocks, uh, in the case of ETH2, something much smaller to begin with, um, but know the full state of the chain um, and are accessible to the validator for any of the kind of uh, computation or confirmation it needs to do as it looks at a testing blocks. Um, this is, uh, in, in, in some uh, proof of stake systems and in some validation setups, these are actually condensed into one piece of software. The validator and, and the, the beacon node are effectively the same. Um, in ETH 2.0, at least uh, with all the development efforts that have happened so far, they are explicitly different pieces of software. Um, one of the really nice things about this is validators themselves will be a little bit easier to run. Um, so they're going to be lighter weight pieces of software. They don't need to have, you know, the many terabytes of chain state associated with each validator. Um, they can turn to the beacon nodes for that. Um, and this becomes pretty necessary when you look at, at some of the, the consequences of that 32 ETH mechanism that we talked about in a, uh, a second ago. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's if I'm a kind of hobbyist running a, a validation setup. Uh, this infrastructure becomes more complicated if I'm a fund, an exchange, somebody who um, has a much larger stake on the line and, and needs higher reliability guarantees um, because the consequences are, are much larger. Um, so this is where the third part of our, our staking setup comes in, which is, is the actual signer. Um, so this is a pretty typical way of, of breaking down infrastructure for staking. Um, you have many beacon nodes, so you have fault tolerance on the beacon side. Um, there's a load balancer between them and the, the validators. Um, so any number of validators can communicate with any number of beacon nodes. Um, and then uh, the signer here, the, the new part of this infrastructure diagram is, is basically a service that stores your keys and does the actual signing of the blocks. Um, and the reason this is usually separated out in um, kind of more production setups is this, this is a really security sensitive, uh, sensitive part of the, the entire workflow. Um, so not only is it, is it where your key management happens, but it's, it's where that actual uh, attestation, the, the signing portion of it happens, um, which tends to be where a lot of the risk of slashing is. Uh, it's also uh, where the risk of, of kind of, uh, you know, uh, hacking and attacks uh, towards, towards one of these uh, larger players would, would be more focused. Um, and so uh, by separating them out, you can basically have greater security guarantees for this most sensitive part of your system um, and, and kind of more flexibility around the validators that you have. Um, and so anyway, uh, typically what, what folks will do is also have load balancers between their validator setup and their signing services um, so that uh, there's also fault tolerance there. So um, the basic mechanism here, it, it's actually kind of similar to uh, the original ETH diagram that we showed at the very top of this presentation where, um, you know, to get high availability, to get high percentages of, of reliability, you really need to run many of these nodes at a given time. Um, and so this setup is basically geared entirely towards making sure that you as a validator, you as a staker have the most reliable possible setup to maximize upside and, and uh, minimize those, those uh, reliability related penalties. So that's, that's validation in general. Um, looking at ETH2, there's some things that start to get pretty scary here. So as we've mentioned, uh, validators should, uh, if they're kind of acting logically, stake exactly 32 ETH. Um, so they have to deposit, deposit 32 ETH to become a validator in the first place. Um, and like I mentioned, no economic incentive to store more than 32 ETH. Um, so especially any of these institutions that have the ability to run significant infrastructure are highly incentivized to just divide all of their ETH between as many validators as possible. Um, so if you want to stake more, if you want more rewards, you really need to run more validators. Um, the numbers here get, get pretty frightening. So uh, a fund that, say, let's say, holds 100,000 ETH um, would have to run something like 3,000 validators to get the most upside um, on their staking. Um, this is actually low compared to what a lot of exchanges are dealing with. So, uh, you know, some of the folks we've been talking to are, are 
uh, you know, looking at having to support, uh, barring some technical innovation, hundreds of thousands of, of validators, uh, which is a really, really dramatic uh, uh, contrast to the staking as exists for most networks today. Um, so for, for most setups that these large companies are running, they really get away with, you know, low double digits of nodes, even single digits of nodes to get the kind of reliability that they need um, in a lot of cases. Um, but because of these mechanisms around ETH2, um, they're basically staring down this, this kind of monumental challenge on the infrastructure side, uh, which is pretty scary. And so our, our infrastructure diagram from before, which looks pretty manageable, uh, but is even something that, that large institutions struggle with today, um, gets really out of hand when you start talking about ETH2, like the number of validators you need to run uh, is determined by this, this total ETH number, but you actually need to scale the signers and beacon nodes uh, kind of in lockstep with the validators that you're running. So the total burden on your infrastructure uh, gets really, really significant. Um, unfortunately, this gets even worse when you talk about sharding. This entire thing basically gets multiplied 64 times, particularly the, the beacon node side is, is where the, the majority of that infrastructure work will come in. Um, but you're looking at this just tremendously, uh, tremendously large challenge on the infrastructure side uh, if you're looking to take full advantage of, of kind of what ETH2 has to offer in terms of staking. Um, but in all seriousness, it, it, it is uh, something significant and it, it's something that's going to take a lot of time to figure out for a lot of these institutions. Um, you know, Alchemy is actually working alongside them to kind of solve this in a way that's reusable for, for many players in the ecosystem so that not everybody has to solve this, this tremendously difficult uh, infrastructure challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not, you're, you're going to need a team to, to look at setting up tens to potentially hundreds of thousands of servers. Um, the other thing is that uh, running a distributed infrastructure like this uh, and avoiding unintentional cheating uh, actually gets extremely difficult. And so doing things like double signing uh, are treated like the network as if they're entirely malicious behavior that can actually just happen if your setup, uh, you know, isn't set up as a kind of distributed system with the appropriate guarantees around signing and, and single signing per validator. Um, and so not only is the base infrastructure challenge really significant, you also have to worry about uh, coordinating things in a way that avoids this. Um, obviously, the expense is, is going to be pretty massive. So, so the nice thing is because the validators are, are lighter weight, um, they're going to be a little bit less expensive to run, but um, you're still going to be looking at running beacon nodes, signing services, and, and like I mentioned, you know, you're, you're running thousands to, to hundreds of thousands of servers. Um, so the lift there is going to be pretty expensive. Um, and coordinating a, a system like this uh, is, is going to be a pretty tough challenge, even for really talented uh, engineers who've been doing this for a long time. Um, and so not only is the infrastructure cost uh, quite high, but, uh, you know, the amount of human capital that will have to be invested into solving this at a, at a lot of these, these larger players is, is going to be really significant. Um, I think, you know, our, our lens on it is uh, when we approached the ETH space, we, we looked at this kind of traditional way of, of doing Ethereum infrastructure and decided that it really needed a redesign with Web3 in mind. Um, I think likely what's going to happen and, and where kind of our early efforts have taken us is that, um, the, the same kind of pattern will need to be applied to, to staking here. Um, you know, if, if any significant portion of holders of, of ETH uh, move over to ETH2 and, and you know, are, are actually staking as, as is expected, there's going to be a tremendous amount of, uh, of infrastructure in general that needs to be built here, um, unless there's this technical innovation. So the thought is, uh, it, it may re require this kind of fundamental redesign, fundamental shift in thinking about how validator setups work. Um, so that you can avoid having to run uh, hundreds of thousands of servers potentially. Um, and so, you know, the natural consequence to this is, is why bother? Um, uh, the thought is the rewards are actually significant to justify real serious investment in this on the, the infrastructure and engineering side. Um, so because, you know, tentative numbers, something like 11,000% uh, and, or sorry, 11% annual staking returns, uh, I wish it was 11,000. Um, uh, there, there's really significant upside uh, if you're one of these large holders of ETH to actually figure out this problem. Um, so for that same fund who's staring down the barrel of running 3,000 validators, um, they're also uh, looking at potential upside uh, in, on the order of $2.6 million per year in, in kind of uh, uh, just, just pure staking rewards, um, which is really significant at, at, at the current price of ETH, of course. Um, and so it, it really is worth looking into and spending the time to, to figure out and, and even the, the headaches that will come with, uh, with this kind of unique uh, 
set of constraints that's, that's placed on staking in, in the ETH2 world. Um, and for the, these larger funds, uh, there is literally uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of incentive for them to jump in and, and actually start staking uh, with kind of the proper distribution of ETH amongst their validators, that, that 32 ETH per validator setup. So um, it's complicated. It's, uh, it's quite a difficult task to, to take on, but there is this, this real incentive um, and real reason that, that people are taking a look at it. Can I ask you, uh, just a real quick question while we're talking about the finance? So, um, of course. Obviously, if the, if the price of ETH, you know, goes up, God willing, um, it, it will make kind of operating a validator or kind of staking like very, very expensive. So is there some type of like game theory in terms of like, if you're going to, if you think that eventually you might start staking, you actually, it's worth the investment to kind of buy the ETH and do it and get your ETH now because the, the, the number of uh, ETH that needs to be staked is fixed. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, to be honest, I expect, uh, as with anything, these things, can be changed as the network grows and changes. It's just gonna be very difficult. So, uh, you know, I expect for the foreseeable future, 32 ETH will be the value. If ETH all of a sudden is $10,000 per ETH, I would imagine that the network is actually incentivized to, to make changes and make it more accessible to people. Um, so I would, I would think in the most dramatic versions of this, um, I, would, I would say like, you know, folks generally are incentivized here to make sure that running a validator is as, as accessible as possible for the overall security of the network. So um, these things are slow moving, but uh, if there was a really dramatic change in the, the price of ETH, I would expect that that would be something that would slowly follow. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, obviously if, if you expect that the value of, of ETH is going to go up as, as uh, uh, many people do, um, you're effectively going to have a cheaper buy-in as a validator the, the sooner you, you join on. Um, I think the other thing to take a look at is that um, the sooner you join on as a validator, uh, the, the less you have to worry about kind of those, those wait lists and the, the competition uh, and, and kind of the, the consequences of, of not being there uh, earlier. Um, I, if you look at the actual dollars, like some of the larger exchanges, larger funds, larger holders of ETH, for every day that they're late to the game with staking, they're potentially sacrificing hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in overall staking rewards. Um, and so I think, it, you know, there's, there's lots of incentive, whether it's uh, the kind of the price of ETH or, or just the, uh, the, the kind of mechanisms of becoming a validator that, that kind of incentivize people to, to jump on this early if, if, it's, if it's interesting and if they're willing to, to commit to, um, you know, uh, actually solving the, the, uh, the staking problem and the, the infrastructure work that goes on there um, successfully. Perfect. Um, Cool. Yeah. So just uh, in, in a little bit of summary, staking on E2, it's going to be a massive uh, investment in terms of understanding infrastructure, engineering. Um, you know, lots of teams will, will try to tackle this in-house. Uh, those teams generally will have very, very large teams of engineers that are dedicated to solving this problem. Um, you know, folks like Alchemy are also going to be trying to solve this as, as kind of a third party um, to make sure that uh, anybody who wants to stake with, with kind of moderate scale or, or high scale will be able to do so. Um, without having to kind of solve what is uh, maybe one of the most difficult, probably the most difficult infrastructure problem in, in blockchain, um, net new uh, in-house themselves. Um, but, you know, regardless of which path you go, uh, the, the core tenant here is uh, the economics need to make sense. Um, and at least at the outset, it, it looks like they do. Um, there's potentially um, uh, really, really strong incentives in, in terms of the staking rewards and the compounding interest, frankly, in, in the staking rewards that you're earning. Um, and so it uh, begs, begs attention, despite the fact that it is this, uh, this big meaty problem to solve. So what's next? Um, uh, so first multi-client testnet on ETH2 uh, actually rolled out a few weeks ago. Um, so, so basically to, to dive in a little deeper on what's going on right now, um, uh, the main effort that's happening in anticipation of the, the July launch is uh, many different teams, something like nine, uh, nine to 12 teams are working on building out the actual clients and actual validator software. Um, up until very, very recently, they were kind of building them uh, in their own silos, making sure the basic functionality worked. One major milestone that, that happened recently is they started communicating with each other. So uh, on a single network, many of these different pieces of software are running in conjunction, conjunction um, actually kind of doing the, the proof of stake uh, mechanisms uh, together, which is, is a huge step towards the actual release. Um, so, uh, you know, 
one of the, the first things next is basically monitoring the success of, of that step um, in the ecosystem and, and making sure that uh, you know, that goes well as, as kind of a precursor to launch. Uh, but of course, after that's all ironed out, um, Beacon Chain phase zero um, is where this really starts to get interesting for people. Um, that's rolling out as soon as July. Um, I would say July is, is kind of the optimistic timeline from, from what I've heard, um, but something to be on the lookout for. Um, and just as a note, uh, I mentioned this early in the presentation, but um, there will be no transfers. Um, there, it's kind of only this, this staking rewards mechanism. Um, so for a lot of people, it won't make sense to jump on right away in July. Um, if you're primarily an application developer, probably not the time for you to pay a ton of attention to, to ETH2 because there's no accounts, no state, no smart contracts. But for anybody who holds a significant, significant amount of ETH, uh, really, if you hold 32 ETH or more, it's, it's worth looking at um, jumping on uh, as the chain launches in July, obviously taking into account um, any risks of, of being an early adopter. But um, there, there is upside to, to jumping on there. Um, Just to be clear, so rewards start in July. I mean, like whenever it launches. Yeah, so rewards start whenever it launches and, and with the, the proper number of uh, validators. Um, so I, I imagine it won't be uh, on day one uh, as people get ramped on, especially with, with the wait times to jump on as a validator. Um, but uh, ex expect that the rewards will fast follow um, from the actual phase zero launch. Um, I, th I think a lot of the, the, the recognition from the teams building this out is that, um, you know, there is, there is some amount of, of goodwill that will get you uh, so far when you're, you're rolling out this kind of network. And, you know, people want the, the ecosystem to be successful. It's, it's generally um, a, a really positive ecosystem that way, but there do need to be economic incentives to, to back up this sort of behavior. And so um, for that to get real adoption, there needs to be kind of real incentive for folks to, to jump on. And so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, as, as far as taking rewards, uh, expect that uh, that'll fast follow from the actual release of, of phase zero and, and the onboarding of those initial val validators. Um, and so the, the, the main recommendation here is uh, if you're interested, start preparing early. So there are those kind of hard limits in terms of hours or, or days in terms of getting onboarded as a validator. Um, the time investment required gets more significant when you look at um, kind of the actual engineering time required to solve this problem in-house. Um, it's uh, a, a very complicated problem. Um, if, if your team has uh, exposure to, to staking and, and running these things in-house, even then would encourage them to take a look at the, the parts that are kind of unique to, to ETH since it does kind of balloon the, the kind of surface area of infrastructure that you have to deal with. Um, and then, you know, if, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you want to talk to, to our team about how we're thinking about it and what we're doing, uh, would encourage you to reach out. Um, we're working on this with, with a few partners and, and some major exchanges. Um, trying to, to kind of start solving the problem early um, and make sure that uh, anybody who, who wants to do this without having to make a significant investment in-house in terms of engineering time is, is able to do so. Um, so yeah, we would encourage folks who are interested, even, even if you just, uh, just want to know more about uh, kind of ETH2 and, and the efforts that are going on there, um, should definitely reach out and, and uh, chat with us. We're, uh, we're friendly folks. Just a quick question. So for just from a retail standpoint, if I have 32 ETH and I don't want to like have to figure out how to do this, can I just like sign up with Alchemy or something? Or how does that work? Is it that retail friendly? Or is it just so simple for the average person to just, you know, kind of go to a website and then stake it that they don't have to worry about it? Like how much for the, for the lay person, the lazy lay person like me, how, you know, what, what is the kind of like path of least resistance? Yeah, for sure. So um, as far as the, the product that Alchemy is working on, um, I think that's the, the eventual goal is to make it uh, as easy as possible to stake to uh, Alchemy and, and Alchemy's validators so that you don't have to worry about this at all. Like, like you said, go to a, a UI, uh, transfer some ETH uh, and, and kind of onboard as a, a validator um, with no effort on, on your end. The, the initial focus on our side has been a little bit more towards uh, those, those uh, larger partners and, and exchanges who... Uh, are facing this kind of much more significant infrastructure problem where, um, you know, they're looking at running thousands and thousands of servers to support the kind of uh, ETH holdings that they have. Um, and so for those engagements, uh, you know, the idea is much more, we're going to work with your team to figure out what makes sense as far as the footprint, since it's, it's probably going to be uh, one of the, the biggest parts of your infrastructure as a, as a company. And so it's, it's a, a pretty significant undertaking. Um, but I think, you know, uh, as, as this effort grows out for, for us, I expect it'll, it'll grow and kind of backfill from those, those larger partners with really significant infrastructure problems to the lay person who has 32 ETH and, and wants to, to take advantage of the rewards on ETH2. 
Cool. There are, there's a bunch of uh, questions that are kind of stacked up in the chat. So uh, maybe we can shift over to that. That sounds great. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, Julian uh, is asking, can you comment on uh, inflation rate will change going to ETH2 and then longer term? Uh, so I don't, I don't know a ton. Like I, I know that the inflation rate is expected to change. Um, so uh, to be honest, I don't know a lot about the policy of uh, what's expected around the, the actual inflation rate changing. Um, I would expect that uh, it's, it's likely to go down over time. So uh, starting at 11%, um, maybe with some mobility in the, in the downward direction as kind of uh, competition increases among validators and the, the ecosystem is, is kind of healthy and, and full of validators. So there's less incentive to kick people off to, to move on in the first place. That's entirely speculative on my part though. Um, I actually don't know what the ETH foundation or, or kind of the, the client implementers are thinking in terms of how that inflation rate will change over time. But I do know that it's, it's fully expected that uh, that rate is, is configurable and, and will change as kind of the properties of the network change. Cool. Uh, Christopher's asking how might the, uh, what might be the hardware requirement to run a validator? Potentially, a staker can run multiple instances on a remote server. Yeah, so so that's something we're we're looking into right now. The validators tend to be um, relatively light, especially if you're comparing. I don't know if if, if you in particular are familiar with uh, like Ethereum full node setups or even even light node setups. Um, so something like uh, an Ethereum full node might cost you. $500 a month to run on AWS, a large portion of which is, is kind of the attached storage that's involved. Um, the validators have effectively no attached storage. So um, it, it, it all comes down to kind of trade-offs you want to make on the, the reliability side. But um, we're thinking it's going to be $100 a month, sub $100 a month per validator that you would need to run. Um, hopefully much, much, much less than that um, since uh, you don't need things like, like EBS volumes uh, to, to make them run effectively. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, was, was there a second part of that question, Jahan? I, I forget. Uh, uh, no. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so I expect, uh, should be runnable. Like if you wanted to run, uh, uh, a validator for ETH on your, your laptop, for instance, I would expect you could not a great idea in terms of reliability and, and attestation. Uh, but in terms of requirements, uh, you're not looking at like big beefy AWS servers. Uh, it's going to be pretty maintainable. Oh, the, the second part was uh, running, I think running multiple validators on the same box. Um, and so, yeah, the, uh, that's, that's certainly possible. Um, so if you have kind of a larger piece of hardware and you want to run multiple validators at once, uh, kind of as virtual machines on the same box, um, that's, that's certainly a possibility. Um, the thing you're going to have to look at is uh, kind of associating keys with individual validators and, and managing kind of the, the accounts, uh, the staking and, and the signing portion of it. Um, so yeah, the, when, when we say uh, running a certain number of validators, there's going to be some virtual, virtualization involved in that. So um, you're not looking at running uh, 100,000 separate uh, AWS servers necessarily, um, but can definitely uh, kind of partition those and, and run things in a little bit more efficient way. Cool. Uh, and then um, Arthur's asking, uh, under ETH2 proof of stake, how is the gas fee affected? Uh, can users' gas fees be paid by the dApp they use? And how does the expected return of a validator compare to the typical DeFi staking of ETH? Uh, sorry, what was the, the last portion? I think it's, it's looking at like, uh, re, you know, if you're locked up in Compound or something like that, or, or you know, one of these DeFi applications, like, is it going to be better to um, stake or uh, you know, lock in DeFi. Got it. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So to answer the first part of that question. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm blanking on the, uh, the first part. Let me just pull up the chat. Uh, we'll the oh, so yeah, gas fee and, and whether dApps can, can pay for it. So, uh, there is, uh, as, as far as I know, so this is looking forward to phase two. So there's, there's a lot that's, uh, uh, pretty amorphous about this. The, the, the teams building ETH2 have been uh, really, really focused on, on kind of the short term uh, and getting the actual proof of stake uh, mechanisms out there. Um, as far as gas fees and, and kind of the interactions um, with, uh, with dApps and whether dApps can pay for them themselves, there's, there's no kind of native mechanism for that um, that we've talked about. So uh, I, I'm sure given you're, you're pretty informed in, in asking this question, you're familiar with efforts like um, the gas station network on uh, Ethereum 1.0, these, these kind of side chains, if you will, but, but kind of uh, parallel node setups that allow mechanisms like this, like for dApps to pay for gas for, for users. 
Um, I expect that that's, that's how it'll work on, on ETH2 as well, that um, this is kind of something that's a little bit more uh, application specific, uh, where application is, uh, in this case, is very broad, pretty much all dApps built on Ethereum. But um, yeah, so as, as far as I know, ETH2 doesn't have any plans to solve that portion in particular, but um, will support the, the same kind of ways that, that are uh, being experimented with and, and look promising in, in the ETH1 world. Um, and then for the, the DeFi portion, um, I, from, from what I know of, of uh, the DeFi apps that I'm familiar with, the, the staking rewards on, on ETH2 are pretty competitive with what's being offered in, in terms of rates. Uh, like uh, I know a lot of the, the, the popular apps have something like 6% um, interest rates on, on the lending. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the initial 11%, uh, 10 to 11% that you're looking at with, with ETH2 is certainly competitive with that. Um, I expect there's, there, you know, as, as with any of this, Corollary, this is not investment advice at all, of course. Uh, I, would, I would expect there's going to be some diversification between staking and uh, staking on ETH2 explicitly and, and staking in, in the DeFi sense. Um, and so, uh, it, and, and uh, the nice part about DeFi is that uh, in, in a lot of cases, there's not a lot of upkeep to the capital that you're, you're staking. Like the, the protocol is, is taking the responsibility of, of putting your money to work for you. Uh, whereas in the validator case, uh, either you or a partner that you're working with is having to run kind of physical infrastructure and, and actually perform the role of a validator. Um, so even if even if the uh, uh, rewards are higher um, in the shorter long term, there, there's kind of a balance, I think, um, to where you'll want to put your money and, and where you want to invest uh, just based on who you are, what you're willing to do and, and kind of the, the setups that you're running. Okay, cool. That's all the questions out of the chat. So why don't we just kind of open up more generally if, if you guys um, have anything and, and why don't we, you know, kind of give like a, a virtual clap for Mike. Uh, that was really an incredible uh, presentation. I, I really feel like I have a pretty good handle uh, on, hey, my, on staking. Right. I should also mention that, uh, that uh, it's quite early where Mike is uh, and he was a really good sport. Uh, <laughs> my, kind of time, my, my time shift or time... Uh, brain fart uh, and he gamely got up it's you know pre 6 30 a.m to do this so really appreciate that taking one for the team of course um, but yeah let's open it up and and uh please ask ask away or just hang out and chat and comments and questions although not all at once Yeah, it's been what happens. Just wanted to say again, thank you for uh, for including me in the, the meetup here. It's uh, awesome to talk to a, a broader audience of, of people about things that I, I really like chatting about. So uh, thank you those who have already asked questions, uh, really thoughtful questions, um, and to all of you for, for coming out and, and listening. It's been There's a, another one from Christopher, which is uh, potentially one can earn from validation and uh, DeFi at the same time, as long as a DAO would accept staked ETH as collateral. Ooh, that's a fair question. Yeah, that's reasonable. I, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought. I wonder if uh, protocols will kind of... Uh, it's kind of like rehypothecating an asset, right? I mean, like, there would have to be... Yeah. A, it's kind of like um, you would have to haircut uh, the kind of collateralization of the... In case of the... Um, what do you call it? The, uh, the risk of, of getting slashed for any particular uh, right. reason. But yeah, I mean, I guess that's... Uh, you could do it. Just to, Yeah, I, I imagine that'll be up to the, the specific... DeFi protocols and, and DAOs, uh, like you mentioned, and what kind of risk they're, they're comfortable with there. Uh, Julian's got a question. So if no smart contracts on Beacon Chain, then DEX won't be using ETH2 until a later phase, another two years, question mark? Yeah, so for sure. So, so I think the short-term interest in, in ETH2 is entirely, uh, basically entirely the returns that you can get um, from, from the actual staking mechanisms. So any sort of application that you think about in the ETH world is, is typically not going to care about the, the very short-term phases unless they have treasuries in ETH that they are, are looking to, to kind of invest with, with staking operations. Um, so DEXs, wallets, uh, any sort of DAP um, really is not going to find use in ETH2 until likely phase two. Um, so the, the kinds of teams that we're seeing um, looking into this, it, I guess this is a little bit my fault. So when I, when I mentioned exchanges, generally it's, it's kind of like the custody portion of exchanges, the, the holdings portions of exchanges that are, are interested in the short term of, of ETH2, um, uh, just because uh, there isn't very much functionality in the initial, initial version. It's a, it's a very conservative uh, release uh, in that way. Uh, with phase zero. Uh, so yeah, the, the DEX community, all these sorts of, uh, you know, really vibrant parts of the Ethereum one community 
um, are going to have to wait for the fur further phases. Um, one, one of the most interesting parts about that is um, uh, there's, there's eventually going to have to be a state migration from ETH1 to ETH2. So as ETH1.0 gets deprecated, um, everything that's happened as part of the history of the chain somehow needs to get ported over to ETH2.0. Um, this, uh, at least the last time I checked, is, is kind of a, an area of research still uh, a little bit under discussion with the folks who are building out the clients on the ETH2 side. So um, I think, you know, the, the estimates I've heard so far are sometime early 2020 for that kind of full version of ETH2. Um, so I think for those who are, are looking... Early 2021. Sorry, 2022. Um, 2022. So 2021 is, is when we're, we'll start to get the um, beacon chain plus sharding. So experimenting with some of the scalability mechanisms, uh, you know, figuring out how to run validators with, with that extra portion. Um, and then 2022 is when uh, tentatively the, the kind of accounts transfer smart contract functionality and, and like full state from ETH1 uh, will be making its way to, to ETH2. Who loses? from uh, the transition to ETH2? It's a very good question. I, th I think the big one is uh, miners, like the, the most obvious one for sure. Like a, a lot, in a lot of cases, these miners have invested in, in very specific hardware. Um, so ASICs, these, these a uh, application specific circuit boards um, can really only be used for, for explicit mining. Uh, I don't know, if, I know enough about the details. I, I think likely the most efficient ones can only be used specifically for Ethereum mining as well. Um, Ethereum, and so, honey. Uh, Ethereum. Um, and so, um, you know, likely there's really significant capital investments in those mining operations that they'll need to find some ways to repurpose. And I genuinely have no idea what, what they'll do with those things. Um, would, be, would be curious actually to talk if anybody knows more about the mining side about how they're planning for, for proof of stake. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the consequences of, of the way that proof of stake is being rolled out is that it, it's kind of meant to democratize or decentralize the, the kind of security mechanisms of the network. Um, and so one of the things that, that gave rise to ETH2 in the first place is that, you know, there's this really significant consolidation of mining that was happening amongst the, like, the really large uh, mining operations with these, these specialized pieces of hardware. Um, and so by removing the, the, the need for any kind of specialized hardware um, in, in that same sense, uh, I think uh, those, those folks are, are probably losing. Honestly, like, I, I think, the rest of the ecosystem generally profits. Like our, our, our kind of biased long-term view at Alchemy is that the value of, of any blockchain network is gonna come from the applications that are built on it. Um, and so if more valuable applications are being built on Ethereum because of Ethereum 2.0, then you know, the overall price, the overall market cap of, of ETH will go up, which benefits basically anybody who's participating in the ecosystem. Um, and really, I think, uh, you know, the focus of this presentation was on staking because that's the, the near term thing. I think the most exciting parts of ETH2 are the ways in which it makes uh, applications function better through scalability, through ease of use, all these sorts of things that the ETH Foundation has been working on for a tremendous amount of time to, to improve and, and solve uh, uh, since they've been core issues with, with ETH 1.0. Um, so I think, you know, Question mark around the uh, the miners out there. Hopefully, their their operations are, are okay and they're able to transition. I, I think it's going to be tough given the specialized hardware, uh, but everybody else I think stands to benefit, especially in the long term. Yeah. Hello. Um, so anyway, this is Christopher. I just thought I would chime in because I'm the uh, Ethereum miner that you guys are talking about. Um, first and foremost, a uh, great presentation. I think Thank the you. right way to prepare for proof of stake is to uh, join your meetup event and to hear hear you talk about it. Um, but <laughs> overall, I would say today, um, I'm hearing mostly positive news. Like for okay. me, I've been mining with uh, Ethereum hardware, say graphics cards, um, um, GeForce 1060 since year 2017. It's been three years already. And from what I'm hearing today, it seems like my same equipment can continue mining until 2021 another two more years. And what I've seen in the past one or two years or so is that people have been reluctant to invest into um, new equipment. As such, the uh, Ethereum hash rate market difficulty has been fairly stable. In other mm -hmm. words, my old equipment has been fairly profitable up to now, and it might continue to be so uh, for the next one or two years, right? If, if say, um, like what you said, uh, the if 1.0 chain is gonna stay alive for a while longer, 
Yep. Yeah, certainly. So, so yeah, that's, that's the other caveat here that we haven't touched on at all is that uh, ETH 1.0 will exist and, and has to exist, frankly, for, for quite some time while all of this ETH 2.0 uh, nonsense is sorted out. Uh, you know, it, it, all of the applications, all of the, the kind of wonderful things about ETH will still be running on the ETH 1.0 chain. And so miners will still be uh, an incredibly important part of that ecosystem. Um, that's, that's, that's interesting, Christopher. Maybe we could talk about this off, offline too, but I'm, I'm actually curious, will you, you know, looking three to five years ahead, is it expected that you'll, you'll kind of try to transition the mining operations into staking operations um, to do something similar for this new pr proof of stake system or um, yeah, kind of what's the expectation there? Okay, um, what we're pl presently planning to do is to uh, wind down the EVE uh, mining operations when our machine has reached its end of usable lifespan. We were expecting sometime this year, but it seems like the machines, the same old machines will continue running for another two years. And it's entirely possible that um, those uh, old graphics cards from year 2017 will still be uh, profitable. So that's, mm. that's, that's something we're, we're planning. Um, we're not exactly uh, equipped or uh, we don't have that specialization in to, to go into staking because we're just a, a miner, right? A hardware miner, say mining Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin. So that's, that's what we are uh, planning to do. But I think the more interesting point is that because of this um, uh, move to uh, proof of stake that has been ongoing since 2017, there has been uh, um, a reluctance to invest into new hash power. For us, we kind of thought, oh, okay, 2017, the machines will at least run for another two years it makes sense for us to uh, invest back then. And certainly this um, thing comes as an additional upside to us. Yep, that makes perfect sense. That's yeah, awesome. but Thanks. anyway, Thanks, happy to uh, talk more offline. Cool, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, question from Tony, do you expect DeFi rates to rise in order to match the staking yield or could we see an outflow of locked ETH in favor of staking? Similar to- yeah, that's, that, that's a very good question. I think we're, uh, starting to stretch my, uh, my area of expertise here. Uh, but, you know, intuitively speaking, uh, DeFi is obviously incentivized to, have, uh, incentivized to have money locked for their ecosystems to function correctly. So if there's uh, kind of higher incentive for, for folks to be on uh, ETH2 with, with staking in terms of how uh, people in the ecosystem are, are kind of evaluating the trade-offs, then, you know, I would expect they'll, they'll have to adapt in, in some way. Um, I think the, uh, the, the caveat there is, you know, from what I know about DeFi, like there's already a lot of over uh, collateralization. The, the, the rates are actually quite high for, for what they're doing already. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of one of the interesting things to, to watch and, and see over the, the coming months is, you know, how does, how does DeFi adapt to this? You know, in, in the long run, I expect uh, there, will, there will be room for both for sure. Um, and so, you know, any, any DeFi protocol that's working now, I'd expect, uh, you know, maybe they see some outflow, but wouldn't, wouldn't expect it to be true, too tremendous. And the, the other caveat here is, um, you know, for, for organizations, uh, for, for the large players, 32 ETH is, is nothing, right? You're looking at many, many multiples of that. But, um, you know, there is a, a massive uh, category of people who will not have the 32 ETH to stake uh, and, and become a validator. And they won't have any interest in running validator infrastructure. Like, you actually need to be on top of it. Like, you need to be maintaining it um, in, in the absence of a third party doing it for you. Um, and so I, I think a lot of the ecosystem will be still be incentivized primarily to, to invest in things like DeFi protocols. It would actually, I'd, I'd be curious, we, we might be able to pull this info, but um, it'd be interesting to look at the number of stakers to DeFi protocols that have stakes uh, above or below 32 ETH to see, you know, what percentage are, are even capable of, of moving over to ETH2. Um, I, I would guess that there's, there's a healthy enough ecosystem below 32 that, you know, the DeFi protocols will be, will be fine and, and whether, whatever outflow happens, but cool. purely, uh, purely speculative on my part. Um, we're going to be wrapping up in a, in a few, uh, so let uh, Mike get some rest and also getting late here. Um, any last kind of questions? Comments? Cool, if not, um, let's give a, another virtual kind of round of applause for Mike, really appreciate it. Um, we will be um, uh, posting this, uh, the recording. So I, I think it's such an incredible, um, you know, explanation kind of staking, I'm sure a lot of people can benefit from it. Um, and uh, 
So just kind of keep an eye on that. And we'll probably be doing another one maybe next week or the week after. So stay tuned uh, to, the, to the meetup as always. Um, and uh, again, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, and Mike, thanks so much for getting up early and doing this really great presentation. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks again for having me, guys. It was really fun. Thanks.